Hey everybody, welcome back to part two and my discussion on the current state of the argument of whether or not fish feel pain. If you haven't checked out part one yet, there is a link up in the little doobly-doo. Otherwise, there's a link down in the description below. Now for the people who want to argue against pain in animals, there are three basic components to their argument. There's the what, the where, and the why of pain. Key, who I brought up in the previous video, believes that if we answer these questions about ourselves, we can use those answers to look at how fish may experience the same sensations. The argument basically goes that since people are the only animals capable of self-reporting pain, they're the only ones that we can reliably say actually experience it, and we can use the neuroanatomy of people to then give us a starting point for other creatures. I want to use this video to look at the background of why people seem to have this opinion. So we'll start with the where, or rather, where it isn't. Pain, as defined by these arguments, exists in the brain, and that means we need to separate what happens in the brain from what happens in the body. As neuroscientists are fond of pointing out, somebody with a severe spinal injury won't feel pain or anything else in the body below the point of injury on the spine. So it's important that we understand what happens in the brain and what happens in the spine, and I think the answer to this may be something that's going to be surprising to a lot of people. Sure, our brains can't read what's going on beneath the point of the spinal injury, but our bodies can still feel it and still respond. Paraplegics and quadriplegics will frequently run into issues with bodily injuries. Even something as minor as a toenail will cause a runaway response in the body. This response is called autonomic dysreflexia. With an injury, the body will send a message up the spine. It hits the injury, it can't get to the brain, the message isn't sent through. So the spine responds on its own. It begins the sympathetic response. Now the sympathetic response is basically the fight or flight response. It starts constricting blood vessels, spiking blood pressure in the rest of the body. The brain and the upper spine have no idea what's going on, so they start dilating blood vessels and slowing the heart to try to compensate for this. And you end up with this fight between the upper and lower half of the body. In the end, the lower half wins because nothing can really calm it down. So it's a situation where if they don't find the cause and treat it, it can lead to strokes or even death as the blood pressure in the body continues to skyrocket, as the spine keeps making erroneous decisions. And this seems on the surface like the spine made a choice. Did it? Let's look at some other examples before we really try to answer this, because there's a lot of interesting research and historical accounts that really tie into the answer. In 2002, Crown did a study with rats, where they severed the spinal cord and studied the response to electric shock. What they did was they drooped the leg down into a dish of water, and any time the leg would touch the water, it would deliver an electric shock. And the spine learned to pull the leg away. The rat didn't feel this. There was no pain sensation that traveled up the spine to the brain. The rat was not consciously aware of these things happening, but the spine learned to just hold the leg up. This is avoidance behavior. We know that this is avoidance behavior because when the shock was applied continuously, the avoidance did not happen. This is very similar to the response that we see in fruit flies, where they learn to avoid behavior because of unpleasant stimuli. So the spine could decide that it was hazardous on its own and could decide to elevate the leg and keep it elevated without any response from the brain. Now that doesn't really clarify things at all, does it? Is the spine deciding something, or is it just a really complex reflex response? And this is where I go a little bit off topic, because this is one of those places that it's really worth exploring a little bit of background. It's pretty common knowledge that a lot of animals can live for a long time without a brain, or at least without a full brain. The most famous example is probably Miracle Mike. No, not Magic Mike, Miracle Mike. Yeah, the chicken. Okay, so Miracle Mike lived for 18 months after his head was cut off back in 1945. Yeah, it's a real thing. People thought it was a hoax at the time, but the owner took him to a university to have it verified, and what seems to have happened is that somehow the axe missed his jugular vein and left a large part of his brain stem intact. So instead of bleeding out 
His neck clotted over, and the remaining brainstem was enough to control heartbeat, basic reflexes, things like that. He was fed through his neck with a syringe, and the body just took over from there. Mike toured the country for a long time and ended up choking to death on a piece of corn in a motel room because his owner forgot his feeding syringes at a fair. But going back before that, we find a lot of interesting examples. In the mid-1800s, it was common practice to do animal experiments that we would consider incredibly cruel and inhumane today. Removing of heads and pithing animals to remove the brain or part of the brain was one of the more common experiments that was done. They'd remove the brains of birds, amphibians, reptiles, sometimes even mammals, and they put them into various situations to monitor their reactions. The experiments led to a lot of questions about whether seemingly purposeful behavior was exhibiting consciousness or not. Is a headless chicken running around conscious? And this question is still really at the heart of this discussion. So let's complicate this a little bit more. The question of what is conscious behavior, at least in the West, basically starts with Descartes. Yeah, the cogito ergo sum guy. So Descartes proposed that animals might be machines, living automata that do everything mechanically and have no consciousness at all. This was part of Descartes' idea on dualism. The mind was completely non-physical, based entirely in the soul. That consciousness was an aspect of the mind and therefore part of the soul, and since he felt that animals must not have souls, that they must not have consciousness. This is a very heavy influence in thinking today, when many people choose not to get pain medication for their dogs following surgery, because they believe that animals are just machines that can't feel pain. So this led to a group of thinkers we call the mechanists, people like Friedrich Hoffmann, who believed that most everything could be attributed to the physical processes within an animal, that the principles of Newton and Boyle were adequate to explain everything we see in animals and in many cases tried to extend it to people as well. And the competing view, animists like George Ernst Stahl, grabbed onto Cartesian dualism and applied it everywhere. Stahl believed that physical processes alone couldn't account for things, that a spirit had to drive things, that even reflex actions were driven by the soul, an immaterial, immortal spirit which interacts with bodies through an intermediate that he called animal spirits, a sort of barely their matter, which could interact with both the immaterial and the material world. There was a fair amount of crossover in the ideas. Giovanni Borelli was a mechanist, a man who we could think of as a contemporary of Descartes, and he was also the father of modern biomechanics. He developed the first purely mechanical theory on how the heart worked, but he still held a large amount of animist views, saying something akin to, yes, the heart is purely mechanical, but it's the soul that starts it beating in the womb. The soul sees that it's filled with blood and makes it pump, and it becomes habit after that. And this was fairly common. Most mechanists still believed a large amount of animism to explain things. And then, in 1739, a French inventor named Jacques de Vaucanson unveiled a mechanical automata called the digesting duck. It was claimed that the duck could flap its wings, eat grain, swallow water, digest food, and poop out the results using a built-in chemicals lab. And it became a topic brought up in the arguments of mechanists versus animists, which is unfortunate because when it was examined later in 1844, it was found to be a fraud, that it was just storing the grains and pooping out breadcrumbs which had been stained green. But the duck gave people an arguing point for suggesting that pure mechanistic drives could be possible, even in people, leading some to, to begin arguing there was no soul involved at all, which we know because several people were accused of heresy over it. It pushed people away from animism, and by the turn of the 1800s, people were largely ignoring animism, giving purely mechanical explanations for things, like the reflex action described by Hall in 1833, which is really the heart of this whole thing. So Hall described the nerve response to the spine. The nerves picked up a signal, sent them to the spine, the spine sent them back with no intervention from the soul. And it was said in a summary of Hall's work that it's not you who blinks your eye, but your body that does it, because they still very strongly held on to this idea that the mind was somehow just riding around in the body, sitting in your brain, something a lot of people still seem to believe today, despite really well-known cases like Phineas Gage. 
If you don't know who Phineas Gage is, there's a link to the Wikipedia article in the description. In Key's papers, he mentions a study with dogs that have severed spines, where the leg will move to scratch a piece of paper with acetic acid off of itself after a spinal injury, but he gives no citations, so I went looking and I couldn't find anything. But there is something pretty similar about frogs and toads mentioned in most physiology textbooks, da dating from an 1853 book by Edward Pfluger, which puts us just a few years after Hall. Now, Pfluger did a study where he pithed frogs, which usually involves destroying the brain, but in this case, he removed the head entirely. So he pithed the frogs, he suspended them, and then he put a piece of paper with acetic acid on the suspended brainless frog, and he found that the frog's body would try to wipe away the acid by moving up a leg to wipe at the spot. And if he dipped the body in water to wash away the acid, and then he cut off the leg that had been trying to wipe, and then reapplied the acetic acid, the body would then choose a different leg to wipe at the acid spot. The body knew that the leg was gone, and found a new way to remove the irritant. Now, Pfluger believed that what he saw with the leg moving itself was proof of consciousness in the headless frog. That when you removed a leg and the body then chose another leg to wipe the acid with, instead of just waving around the stump, that, that was proof of a rational decision. He argued that consciousness existed both in the brain and spine, either independently or divisible, that it might be scattered around the nervous system all over the place. Now, people responded to this by arguing that this was behavior that was learned in life, that this was just neural pathways that had been formed, the frog regularly would be wiping things off, and that this wasn't any sort of decision-making, this was no active process in the spine, this was just something that happens because it's something that happened while it still had a brain. So, Pfluger responded by doing weird things, like flipping the frog over on its back and lifting up one of the legs way into the air, and then putting acid on the leg. And he found that the other leg would work its way up and wipe the acid away. And this is definitely not something that frogs had ever done in life. No frog has ever found itself in a situation of being on its back, having its leg lifted way into the air, and having to contort its other leg around to wipe its leg off. That isn't something that happens. The pith frog research sort of took off at this point. And they can be a lot crazier than Pfluger's experiment. According to a bit of work by a man in 1869 named Goltz, if you take one and you put it in water, it'll swim. And if you put it underwater, it'll swim to the surface. If you put a jar in the way so that it swims up into the jar, gets stuck and can't get out of the water, it'll swim back down out of the jar and try swimming up again someplace else. Goltz also found that once the brain is destroyed, the frogs would still jump towards a light if their back legs were irritated. Even more impressive, when he put some sort of obstacle in the way, the pith frogs would navigate around it and continue on to the light. Nail claimed that this was essentially being done without a brain, but what was really happening is that the experimenters were just keeping really bad notes about what they were destroying, where heads were severed, what parts of the brain were destroyed, etc. In 1870, Huxley wrote a paper entitled, Has a Frog a Soul? What Nature Is That Soul Supposing It to Exist? Link in the description, if you're curious. Which basically outlined what they had found with more careful research. Here's a rough map from a different source, which summarizes the paper visually pretty well. Huxley is careful to note that once the medulla oblongata is removed, the frog is no longer capable of any complex actions. It loses the ability to even breathe. And here's the interesting thing. In the same article, he notes that once everything in the brain is removed, Pfluger's acid test still works, with the lifted leg and the other leg coming up to rub the acid off. Which, as Pfluger stated originally, seems like problem solving. This muddies the water a little bit, because obviously reflex actions aren't signs of volition. You know, you touch a hot stove and you pull away, that didn't require any willpower. But deliberate actions of purpose seem to. If a brainless body has what seems to be a deliberate, purposeful action, then we're faced with what seems like a pretty bizarre choice. Either brainless, decapitated creatures show signs of sensibility and will, or normal animals 
have to be said to be unconscious machines. And this was pushed a great deal by a man named G. H. Lewes, who did things like demonstrations with frogs which had cut spines. He'd sever the spine halfway down and allow the frog to heal. Then he'd demonstrate two things. If you bother the front half of the frog, it will crawl away on its front legs, dragging the paralyzed back legs behind it, and everybody agreed this was a deliberate action. But if you put acid on the back legs, the hind section will try to flee, while the front section sits motionless. We see similar things in people. If you tickle the foot of a paraplegic, the leg will frequently pull away, even though the person attached to the leg can't feel anything. So Luz pushed this, hoping that people would see the choice, either both halves have consciousness or neither does, and say, well, obviously both sides are conscious. But it went the other way pretty fast, and people started talking about conscious automatons. Huxley looked at the work of Pfluger and Hughes. He saw what was obviously purposeful behavior in the decapitated frogs. He acknowledged it as such. This is obvious signs of will, of intent. And then he took the idea and ran with them in the exact opposite direction that they had hoped. He said that the importance of these experiments is that they show us that actions which seem to show purpose are not enough to assume consciousness. And he took the painful end of Lou's alternative options and said that no behavior is consciously controlled, that consciousness is just a tag-along, writing the body and rationalizing its behaviors, responding to things that the body does, but with no actual control over it, like a steam whistle attached to a train that has no control over the machinery of the rest of the train or where it's going or the tracks, but it can sit and scream all at once. And there's some modern experimental support for this idea, as uncomfortable as we might all find this to be as an idea, but it didn't do anything about the question of consciousness of the spine, it just moved the question. And so the actual argument changed and became whether there is actually a behavioral mark of consciousness at all. And it's a question more of intuition than of science, because there's never been any real experimental data to move one way or the other. If you want to approach it like Huxley and say that there's no reliable third-person behavioral mark of consciousness, then you can very easily dismiss consciousness in anything but yourself. Now, all of that may have seemed like a really big waste of time in a video about pain, but the reality is this is exactly where we are today, and the two sides of this argument are in exactly the same place because they've moved the marker to not be a question of signal response, but a question of conscious processing of those signals. Does this animal consciously know that it is in pain and suffer it from it, or does it simply have a reflex response to stimuli? One side is saying, look, we can do behavioral studies, we can monitor what these things do, and we can find indications of conscious processing of pain in these behavior studies. This is something that is easy to do and it is valid. And the other side says, no, no, no. We can only know pain from first-hand experience and brain scans. And it's probably safe to assume that brain scans apply to other vertebrates, but that's as far as we can go. Which is a little crazy, since it's been almost 150 years since Huxley and Lewes really started arguing about this. And in the original argument, Huxley won. But it wasn't because of any experiments. It was because people chose a side and ran with it, and the science around his side flourished. By the 1900s, textbooks instructed students in repeating Pfluger's acid on the frog experiments, no longer including the question of spinal consciousness. They simply stated as a fact that purposive movements are not necessarily intended movements and that apparent purposeful movement is just repetition of motions learned in life. They failed to mention the follow-up experiment with movements that could not have been learned in life. No experimental data has been given to support it. It just started to be stated as fact. Later in the 30s, Skinner worked to expand reflex behavior to describe nearly all behavior in animals. The mechanistic reflex arc is now a fundamental part of physiology, psychology, and neuroscience. 
sensation and volition are no longer considered, not because they were experimentally excluded, but because the pure mechanists were expansionists who went out of their way to apply it to everything at every chance they got. But very slowly, there's been a pushback. In the 1970s, people decided that the mirror test was an acceptable third-person test for consciousness. And it wasn't until 2008 that it seemed to work in an animal without a neocortex, a magpie. As recently as a couple of weeks ago, people were publishing new studies suggesting that other parts of the brain are heavily involved in consciousness. A new paper in Neuron from Washington University in St. Louis suggests that the cerebellum is fundamental in our processing of conscious thought, acting as a sort of regulatory system and, and general uh, quality filter for the brain. This is something that, in the arguments of Keyes and others, would be completely disregarded because modern neuroscientists have decided that the cerebellum, the base of the brain, only controls motor function and nothing else. So they did some really complex scans of the cerebellum, and they found that only about 20% of it actually has anything to do with motor connections. And the other 80% of it has to do with memory, and emotions, and thinking, and problem solving, and everything else that we do as conscious beings. So to suggest that something cannot have emotions without a neocortex, which is sort of the entire basis of the opposition side is, as of a couple of weeks ago, completely and utterly bankrupt as a position to take. Now, for you personally, the answer to this question, do fish feel pain, relies far more on which of these two camps you sit in than it does on what the actual evidence says. It relies far more on whether you are swayed by the idea that the cerebellum has a large amount to do with emotional processing. It has a, a great deal more to do with whether you believe animals are just machines, whether you believe that we can detect other things through monitoring behavior, or whether you believe those things are completely false. There's some interesting things that play into this, which don't really answer the question, but they're interesting all the same. There's a condition called split brain, where the bundle of fibers running between the two hemispheres of your brain right down the middle, the corpus callosum, gets split, and it stops the two hemispheres of the brain from communicating with each other. Now, for most people, the left half of the brain is where speech is controlled, so the person can tell us what the left half is thinking or experiencing, but they can't talk about what's going on on the right side. But the right side is still experiencing things, and people will have odd problems, like trying to get dressed in the morning, and the other half of the brain tries to rip the clothes off because it wants to go back to bed. People with spinal cord injuries have been shown to have emotional deficits in some areas, but it's really difficult to know exactly what that means because emotion is entirely subjective. They did a study with spinal cord injuries and negative emotional conditioning in 2005 where they showed several angry faces. And one of the faces accompanied a painful electric shock, and they showed that the brain activity in people with injured spines and people without it was different. The people with the injuries showed far less activity in areas of the brain that were involved with learning to expect danger when they saw the angry face, even though the areas that were being shocked were controlled by intact areas of the spine. They had less fear in general, and other studies have shown other areas where emotions are impacted as well. And those kinds of things also might alter the question just a little bit. So the next video, we're going to jump straight into the side that says, yes, they do. We're not going to be looking at the two sides and trying to discuss whether arguments are valid or not. We're just going to be looking at the studies that have been done, what they say, how they're trying to draw their conclusions, and whether those conclusions taken on their own are valid when you're not filtering it through all of this historical background saying nothing that you see matters because you can't actually rely on third-person experience. If we ignore that, then we have to ignore basically all of the papers that are written in opposition to this because they're so full of ridiculous opposition going so far as to say things like we don't even know if other mammals feel emotions because we can't be in their heads. Until next time, 
Everybody take it easy. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe. Go ahead and hit that thumbs up button.